presence. Good to be in God's house. And I know we're always amazed and pleased and even surprised that God comes to be with us every time. But we shouldn't be because in reality we're coming to be with Him. This is His house. You know, when you go visit somebody and you walk in their front door and say, Wow! I'm glad to see you here. I'm surprised that you're here. They say, well, this is my house. Uh, I'm glad you're here. If God was to testify and Christ were walked in here, he'd say, I'm glad you're here too. I'm glad you're in my house. I'm glad that you've come to be with me. Thank you for making in this world of business and so busy, busy life. A world of turmoil. A world that kills faith. Thank you for having faith in me. Thank you for coming to see me. Thank you for holding on to me, David. I believe the Lord would say things like that if he'd walk in here. So we we hear that coming through. I appreciate it. When the devil and friend here talking to the Lord, which is always so open, it's always open for somebody to want to feel that, to say something to God, have a burden to leave with the Lord. Maybe you know, it's a testimony. You know, about the Lord was trying to teach him to love. You know, it's a shame, isn't it, that God's got to teach us to love. Looks like we can just do that all by ourselves. But we can't do it. It's just not in men to do that. Or it's in men to, to love their own, but that's about it. Jesus came to teach them about love. And, and uh, the love he taught them was different than the love that they had. He said that, you know, the Pharisees love the Pharisees. The scribes love the scribes. You know, the Germans love the Germans. You know, the Hindus love the Hindus. But Muslims love the Muslims. I'm not too sure about that. <laughs> but if they love anybody, it's their own. And that's a natural love. But Jesus taught them to love uh, everybody. And that doesn't, uh, that doesn't come from us. It comes from the Lord to have the devil's desire to be able to love the way God loves. And, uh, love what God loves and hate what God hates. You know, it's a lot of times we hate what God loves. And we get in trouble for a long time. Hate what he loves. You gotta love what he loves. You get in trouble with God with God loving what God hates too. You love what God hates. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. All that's in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Love not that. He said, Don't love that. Those things hate God. So don't don't love the things that hate God. But anybody that loves God. We surely should love them. And then people that don't love us, uh, we surely should love them too. To love your enemy. Uh, love those that hate you, and spitefully use you. Uh, and uh, do good to all men. So that, that covers everybody. That covers everybody. Brother Donald, I appreciate his words here tonight. Uh, about how he found this place and his condition when he found this place and then his condition tonight of desiring to be humble before the Lord, desiring to be himself before God. Uh, I love to hear that. I love to hear that. You know, people that find God and then they feel like they're better than everybody else because they found God. What makes you better than anybody else? Because you found him. 
I knew you didn't really find what you need to find in God. God just don't, He don't make you feel superior or better. If anything, it's very humbling to find the Lord. It's just the emphasis that we put on things, how we emphasize God in our life, emphasize what we find about God. You can worship. You can worship about anything. You can worship a brotherhood. If you're not careful, you can you can worship a ministry or a ministry. That, that's happened a lot of nice. You know, it's very strange that we, uh, through the years, have pointed out Babylon and all that Babylon does and their the, the dishonesty, uh, the immorality, that is wrong. Without sin, the big spot on our own God. Realizing that with but for the grace of God, there would go us. There's a Brother Donald quoted it and uh, or he referred to it and uh, one of our songs. What was that last song we sang in the beginning? You know, that's easy to say. It's easy to say. But when it gets down to where the rubber meets the rubber, and you start putting your, your feet in the footsteps of Christ to follow in Him, to fall, walk after Him, uh, there's where the difficulty comes in. Because you can't walk like that man walked with a carnal mind. So your mind has got to be changed. You can't walk like that man walked without a pure heart. So your heart's got to change. You can't walk like that man walked without a clean life. So you've got to become righteous. Without holiness and righteousness and purity. You can't walk like Jesus walked without love. There's just no way. You, you can walk in uh, the general direction. Have you, have you ever gone on the highway and there'd be two roads going side to side? And for a while, you think, hey, they're going exactly where I'm going. But then after a little bit, you, you see it... Uh, the medium between you and them, or the ditch, whatever you call it, I call it a ditch, it just starts getting wider and wider and wider. You, you're still going north, and they're still going north. They're not, they, they go going north and maybe off two or three degrees towards the east. And you may be going off two or three degrees towards the west. You're not going, and the farther you go, at the one you don't see them. Right, they a well, to follow Jesus, you can be going in the general direction that Jesus went without ending up at the destination of where he arrived. We're always arriving, but James Sauter said, we're always arriving but never arrived. In other words, we're always trying to get there, but it don't seem like we ever reach the destination. But there's a, it's in Matthew's writings, uh, I think it's the seventh chapter. And we want God's way, we want God's way to be my way. Jesus speaking in the 13th verse, Enter ye in at the straight gate. You know, there's a gate to get into God's kingdom. There's a way to get into God's kingdom. Straight is a right way. It's the right gate. There's a lot of gates. Broad, wide is the gate. 
See, a gate is nothing more than a door. And in the scriptures it said, Lift up your hands, ye doors, and be ye lift. Lift up your hands, ye gates, and be ye lifted up your everlasting doors. There's doors into the kingdom of God. Do you know that the apostles was doors into the kingdom of God? That's how they entered in. They came through their message. They came through their instruction. They came through water baptism. And then the apostles was the first. But after the apostles got the building, the church needed more. They needed prophets, teachers. First the prophets. First, apostles, secondarily, prophets, and then thirdly, teachers. And then, gifts and helps, governments, miracles, which included pastors and evangelists. There was five offices in the ministry. Those gates that lead to the kingdom of God and lead to the footsteps of Christ. Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life. Few there be that find it. You know, there's a lot of ways. I've heard this preached through the years. Mainly one way, but I've heard it preached different ways. But um, you can put emphasis on anything. Usually, when I heard the emphasis put on this, it was on standards. And if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to have a strict standard because it's going to have to be a narrow passage. You know, give that man squeeze on you, and you've got to be skinny. You can't have a lot of the flesh. But upon uh, now, if you sit down and you begin to meditate about what a Broadway is, a Broadway is very all inclusive. It includes the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's what's in the Broadway. It's men building without consideration of God and His words, without consideration of the spirit of the Lord. Without consideration of the love of the Lord, it's just building it anyway, in any way you would desire to build. But when he said, and there's there's people, I want to tell you about people that's on the Broadway, that Broadway. Some of them have lived in monasteries, in mountains. They starved themselves. They dressed in, in uh, almost rags. Uh, they uh, <coughs> pray to their God till blood runs out their knees crawling up and down steps. They refuse to marry. They refuse to do certain things in thinking they're pleasing God. There's people that ride horse and buggies today and refuse to live in the world that we have. They don't even want electricity hooked to their house. That's their standards. When I think of that, because I've heard men and women, I say, well, there's people out in the world who have better standards than we do. And that don't sound right. There are certain things, when you hit a, a bell and it goes, mom, you know, say, well, that's a good time, but you hit it pop. You know, that was too much. But they yeah, don't rain through. They don't rain through. Does God require us to be on our knees till the blood runs out? 
is he requires to see the reformers begin to draw away. They would take whips and beat their backs till the blood were running down in repentance to God. They did that they had sinned, so they just afflicted pain to their bodies. Thinking that that would cause them to be better, be better people. The thinking it pleased God, does it, would it please God for, for us to take a quit and beat us? If, if I thought God would be happy about me beating myself up, I'd take a bat and just warm me up. <laughs> But that's not God's way. Now, he might take one and work me over and see if I still love him. If I miss him, he may work me over and then say, no, you want to straighten that boy? <laughs> you, know, you hear your dad say that. He chases you. So the, a straight gate in a narrow way, it has to be more. It has to be more than just a life of, of standing. There has to be something else in there that men can't do. A broad way is a way that men can do it. There's things that men can do in religion. This is speaking about two ways of religion. One is true, the way God wants it done, and following Him, and there's not very many that follow Him. Take up your cross daily, denying yourself and dying. Well, you know, prayer has a great effect in your life. But, just sealing your brother a pace from Paducah, Kentucky. When he got saved, it was during the Depression, and he had a route as a mailman. And, and he would stop at certain stops and drink with his buddies and do different things. And when he first got saved, he'd stop and, and say, hey, come on here. Have a drink with us. He said, I turn it up. And he said, I wouldn't let none of it get in my mouth. He said, because I knew I wasn't supposed to drink. He said, after a while, he said, Lord, I can't do it that way. He said, I, I can't live for you and work in this world. So he quit his job. In the depression. I mean, good paying job. And he bought him a farm. He had made enough money on that job. And he bought him a farm. And he moved out to the farm. He said, I'll just live all by myself. He was using the mentality that some men use of living in monasteries, isolated from the whole world, and just living in a little room all by. He said, I'll just live all by myself. And that way, I won't have no trouble. There won't be no evil around me. Not knowing that when he moved to the farm, the old man moved with him. He said, after I got out the farm, he said, I realized I hadn't got away from the evil. It was on the inside. There had to be an overcoming. He, he repented. And two men bought his route. And for some reason, they weren't able to fulfill their agreement. And he was able to go and buy it back. And he worked that route, and he lived for Jesus. I'm trying to go. See, there's a way of living for God, a straight gate. See, the, the gate is straight. The, the way is narrow. 
It, it doesn't include everything that's in this world. It doesn't include the spirit of man. I know this, the doctrine of man, you can't follow the doctrine of man and follow Christ. Because man's doctrine, they're off several degrees. And the farther you go, it may sound like just like, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Yeah. Repent of your sins. Repent of your sins. And then after a while, this one here says, you need, you need to just dedicate your life to God. You need to learn what the Lord wants. You need to start overcoming. You, you need, you're saved now from your past sins, but you need to begin to work in your life of overcoming that that caused you to sin. On this side, you're saved from your past sins. Go tell other people. Get them saved. So what about, what about my life? I'm still sinning. That's all right. Just repent to Jesus. He don't expect you to be perfect. He don't expect you to do anything. <coughs> I mean, you're weak. And you, you're, you're a human being. You've got, that's, that's who you are. Don't, don't worry about that. So you just repent of it every once in a while and, and it's okay. You see two different ways there? There's two different ways. There's two different gates. One of them is straight. One of them is new. You're to love everybody. Don't mistreat anyone. What about those that hate me? Well, you love them too. What <clears throat> hurt me, Brother Mauser? I know that. And I'm sorry. I wish they hadn't hurt you. But they won't ask me for forgiveness. I said, I know that. And I'm sad that they don't. But you forgive them anyway. You forgive people. You have the right spirit. You have to have the spirit of love in your life. The other side said, hey, those people over there in the other church, they ain't teaching what we're teaching. Don't you have nothing to do with them. Don't you even talk to them. Those ain't Christians. Those, are, those people don't know God. Those people haven't got God in their life. Matter of fact, it's okay to hate them. And you can cheat them or Hurt them, steal from them, it's okay. Do you know, do you know in, uh, in Russia, in communism, it's okay to lie if you're lying for the betterment of communism? They, they can sign treaties and lie all they want to because it's for the betterment of communism. But it's okay to hate people. I don't hate everybody. Just certain people, it's okay to hate. You can hate the unsaved. You can hate the other ones that don't believe like you do. So that, but they don't, these over here, they don't believe in, in uh, the same doctrine I do on the Godhead. They're infidels. They're infidels. They don't have no God in their life. At once, at one time, these people, had the power to kill the other ones. They said, hunt them down. Hunt them down. Get your names. We'll send out a team and kill them. You know they did that? They're in the dark ages. They did that. On this side is to be the body of Christ. What about these people that don't believe like we do, Brother Mauser? Don't have nothing to do with it. Hate them. No. No. Listen, the way of the, the way of Christ. You know Christ didn't hate the Pharisees, the Sadducees. I mean he he had, he didn't like their ways. But what but when he when when John the third chapter was wrote, he was speaking to a Pharisee. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He spoke that to the Pharisee. Other times He spoke to publicans. Other times He spoke to Sadducees. Other times He spoke to Romans. 
or Gentiles. I'm not saying so great a faith, no, not in Israel. Thy petition be granted. There's no, there is no room, uh, Delbert, for just man's love in God's economy. It takes his love. When I say his economy, his kingdom, the building. Oh, I think. When we start out, all we have is our love. Uh, until he begins to let love grow in our heart. And let us begin to develop who we can love others. At times in my life, I was in this sin. I said, Brother Nelson, I thought you were in the body of Christ your whole life. Well, I suppose to be. I was in the churches in the body of Christ. And this was my attitude. This was my attitude. I repent of it. I'm sorry for it. Brother Steve Farmer gave us a wonderful message a couple of weeks ago on Thursday night. He said, when you make decisions in serving God, you make the best decision you can. But he said later on, you may learn more about God and you might say, hey, that decision I made was not the best decision to be made. There's a better decision to be made because I know God's will more. You know, if we never grow in God and get more light in God and learn more about God, we won't ever mature. And the closer you get to God, surely we're going to see Him clearer the closer we get to Him. I know. And so I, I pray, God, Lord, make me a straight gate leading to the narrow way. No sin, no God was found in his mouth. I use those verses 39. Out of the, uh, it's Peter. First Peter, second chapter. For Christ left us an example that you should follow in his steps who did no sin, Peter 2.20. Neither was violent found in his mouth. No, the next verse. Probably. Or even here to leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. There's an example. That's in 21, sir. There's an example. There's an example. You know, I I troubleshoot uh, problems at work with Todd. I learned to read uh, schematics and blueprints several years back. And, um, and if, if I can pull a printout, and it gives me the example, it shows me what all the equipment is and all the wires and the numbers. I can, you know, I can trouble shoot problems and find a path called a circuitry or a path. And I can follow that path all the way through that machine and I can find what is not working. Christ gave us a blueprint, a schematic, uh, an example of what it took to please God. And that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four Gospels. Now the rest of the New Testament is the apostles reading that schematic of his and building the kingdom. 
they were reading and following his example of how he told them to do it. And that's what we read in the rest of it. And they were dealing with the world of their day, which included, it's a different world than we're living in today. They were, for, for those uh, years, uh, from you know, pouring out of the Holy Ghost uh, on the day of Pentecost till the revelations at the end of John's life, about a 70 year span, the world was ruled by Rome. The Caesars ruled the world. There was slavery. Uh, there was atrocities. They, they, they dealt, the world they lived in was a very difficult world to live in. Uh, they didn't have AC. Someone was saying how they loved the air conditioning. Who was that? Brother Doug was saying how he loved air conditioning. He wouldn't have loved that world. They didn't have air conditioning. Uh, they didn't, they had very little heating. Well, not very much food. You can... They didn't have a whole lot of human rights. They just, they come in and kill whole communities. Somebody disrupt the Roman Empire, they come in and just crucify them. They lined the roads into Rome with crosses and people dying on them. They used, Jesus was the only one crucified. He's the only righteous man crucified. But up to his point, and after that, there were some of his children were crucified. Christians were hunted down and killed. They, they led that. Now here we are trying to but this schematic, uh, this blueprint in our day, I hope you appreciate the difficulty that ministry has in applying these words to our society. In some ways, we're better off. In some ways, we're worse. We're, we're We've got easy streets so much in America. Do you know that there's great revivals in the third world countries where they don't have air conditioning, where they don't have enough food, where they don't have medical care? Do you know there's great revivals in Africa, in India, where they're so crowded they have any more, they hardly got room to live in India? They got more people in India. India is the second largest nation in the world by population, but they're just a little bitty country. Both people live on top of themselves. Yeah, horrible. You know, we're, get, we're in the wide open spaces in America. You know, you live in your own house with, the, with not 50 or 100 other people living in there. And that, in Haiti, they don't even have houses. Tents. At least a lot of them. But what the, the age we're living in is a faith killing, destroying age. And when you, Jesus told them, He told the Jews in the Old Testament, He said, When you get into the land where I sent you, and you plant you vineyards, and you build you homes, and you get on Easy Street. Well, God told them that. He said, you're going to forget me. And you're going to start going after other gods and doing other things. Do you know they did that? They planted vineyards, and they planted bigger vineyards. They built houses, they built bigger houses. And then they just forgot God. They turned to other gods. They began to destroy and pollute from within. You know, when a, when a group of people exists for a certain amount of time, 
without change, then they begin to implode. I mean, it's just history. They begin to implode on themselves. They begin to turn on themselves. In the kingdom of God, this is a straight way. This is a straight. It's, it's straight. It's right. It's righteousness. This is a way of righteousness. Of, of loving right and living right and being right right in our hearts and our decisions. For Christ left us an example that you should fall in his steps. Verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Peter is teaching this to people that are being persecuted for being Christians. Brother Eugene, that was here the other day from Africa, and Brother Samuel, Brother Samuel from India, both of those men related to me because they're being persecuted for being Christians. It's hard to imagine in America, you know, America's opinion is turning against Christianity, or we're not being persecuted. But they're being persecuted in other countries. Peter is telling them, when you're reviled, revile not again. And when he, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Meaning, you do the same thing. You know, when uh, when a, uh, a foreigner attacks America, it's bad. And it causes our nation to rise up. When Japan dropped the bombs on Pearl Harbor, we dropped bombs on Hiroshima. No, so only our bombs were big. And that's how men do it. That's, that's just the way men are. You, 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 kill, you kill my cat, I'll kill three of your dogs. You know. And much devastation. Over 100,000 killed. I don't know what the total count was, but there's over 100,000 killed for the cities. Most of them probably women and children. Horrible. And that's the way men are. But when America is attacked by Americans, what do we do? We don't, we can't go bomb the city they're from. They're from Philadelphia. Let's go bomb Philadelphia. No, you can't do that. Well, they're from Albuquerque. There's Mom Albuquerque. No, you can't do that. It starts a deterioration and the destruction of America from the inside. Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love, but I doubt whether it is. I haven't found any city in America that deserves that name. I haven't been in all the cities of America, but I can assume correctly that they're carnal men. That's really no cities in their carnal cities, full of drugs, alcohol, immorality, murder, atrocities of all kinds. In the straight way, we only pass through this life one time. You've only got one opportunity to serve God. Now if you miss him, this is the land of the beginning again. You can get back in place and keep on going. But you can't live your life over. We I heard a song sung one time, wasted years, wasted years. Oh how foolish. And a guy was lamenting in his, some guy had wrote a song. 
And he was lamenting that he had wasted some years in his life and he was trying to make up by serving God the rest of his life. Well, thank God. Thank God he come to his senses and that there was some wasted time and he was going to pick up the pace and finish the race. And that's the land of beginning again. A land of going on in God. This body of people that I call the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, started with Brother William Saunders and it started with the spirit of charity. And, the, and he used the term charity referring to the spirit of how he treated other Christians. said, well, Brother Mauser, there's some people that's coming to visit our church. I invited them. And they, they're Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Pentecostal, uh, Luther, or whatever. Uh, and the man's a minister. Well, how are you going to receive him? I said, well, tell him to come on. As long as the man is a moral man, we'll hear what he has to say. We'll give him room to speak. If they're saints, we'll give him room to testify. We'll let him worship with us. We'll let him eat at our table. Good. Thank you for inviting him. Say, Pastor, said, I'm invited. Some people to our church. You make sure that they sit, sit back there close to you and keep a quiet and instruct them a little bit that they're not they're not to be getting up and saying nothing. There's no room here in this church for that. We don't want these other foreign doctrines coming in. See? Brother Saunders had an openness for everybody. Even people that were enemies to him, he had an openness to receive him. One time there was a person from one of our churches said they invited someone said, come to our church and have your pastor come in. And he'll, we'll give him room to speak. And she said, well, our church is just like your church. So why would I want to come to your church? Well, I said, okay, then then my pastor will come to your church and he can get up and speak. I said, oh, no. No, he couldn't speak in our church. He's, he's not a card carrier. See? So, I'm inviting this preacher to come and he, he wants to have something to say about Jesus to the church. Well, does, does he have a card with our organization? No, true? No. Well, he can't speak. He can't speak. If he's not a card carrying minister and been ordained by the group of elders that rule this thing, he can't do it. Over here, they said, I don't even have a card. I'm not a card carrier. There's no man giving me the authority to preach the gospel. I've had people ask me, say, who ordains you? Who gives you the right to preach? I said, Jesus. He gave me, he gave me the gift. Yeah, right. He called me. Yeah. He saved me. Yes. I said, well, what about a group of men? Don't you have a group of men that give you a paper to tell you you can preach? I said, oh, I've never found a group of men with that authority. I've never found a group of men that have the authority that outrules God. So the papers don't mean anything. And if a man says, I'm a preacher, and he gets up and he gets behind the pulpit, I can tell you within five minutes or less if he's a preacher. If he's just a talker 
are whatever. You can, when they open their mouth, you see into their heart. And you don't want to see it. But we're desiring to build the straight gate. A straight gate and a narrow way. God help us. God help us to do it like Jesus did. And to do it like Brother Saunders did it as much as he did it right. Brother Saunders perfect and his operation. Well, no, because in the, in the ladder of restoration, he hadn't arrived at the restored church. But he was right in his spirit. Do you know that spirit is more important than anything else? So what about people that don't live a right life, Brother Mouser? If they got a right spirit, you can teach them and lead them into what's right, and they'll follow. What about people that don't have the right doctrine, Brother Mouser? If they've got the right spirit, they're teachable. You can educate them. What about the people that don't have a government. If they've got a right spirit, you can just leave them, buddy. They'll, they'll follow. They'll follow. Our spirit is so important of how we treat God, one another, and all of mankind. We're to do good to everybody, not just Christians. Do you know we're to do good to everybody, not just Christians? And we're to, to do good to everybody that calls the name of Jesus, not just a gospel assembly people. Do you know what a narrow mind does? Here's what narrow mind is in this case. You draw it down, well, I don't... I don't really love the ungodly. And then you draw down, I don't really love anybody except Pentecostals. And then you narrow it down, I don't love anybody except the body of Christ. Then you pull it down, well, I don't love anybody except those that preach this certain doctrine. Or a standard in the body of Christ. Then you kind of narrow it down there more and say, boy, this is the really elite group. They're the ones that's living the best and the holiest and the righteousness and the smartest. And so I don't really, when I say love, uh, have a concern for it. And really, have your heart for them. Want to be with them. Want to help them. You narrow it down, and after a while, even within the body of Christ, there's just a small <coughs> fragment that you care about. You want to help them. Our vision has got to be broader. We've got to be concerned about everybody. I love, I help them, God, to love the ungodly. I'm not going to follow the ungodly. I'm not going to live like the ungodly. But I'm concerned about them. Why? Because the other why are we concerned about the ungodly? Because God he does. He loved them. He died for them. I'm concerned about all of Christianity. Why? They call him the name of Christ. There's some of them that love God, that know Him. That's going to be a part of the body of Christ. I'm concerned about Pentecost. I'm concerned about the entire body of Christ. In the body of Christ, there's people that don't teach the same doctrine I teach. There's some that, that teach a different order of government, that teach a different way of serving God. So how many of you is very device? 
The body of Christ is very divisive right now. But I'm concerned about all of them. There's a scripture that has jumped out to me and I've quoted it and used it my whole life. Well, my whole Christian life as an adult in Ephesians. Of what God is wanting. Ephesians 4 and 3. Let me read verse 2. With all loneliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love. That forbearing one another is is staying together, working together, forgiving and laboring, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring, working to endeavor, Brother Todd, and to endeavor is to get on a job and do it, work at it, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. You know that's what we have to have first and foremost. We have to have a unity of the Spirit of God and it's in a bond of peace. There has to be peace. Well, what about government and doctrine and standards and all of these things that are important, Brother Mouser? What about them? Verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Till we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God. Till we all come unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We have to have the right spirit. Brother Sowers, in our day, he said this began in the spirit. And it's going to end in the spirit. And he wasn't talking about the Holy Ghost that day. He was talking about that spirit of the body of Christ of endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. God help us. Help us. We're just a small assembly, Lord. No, I'm a very, this is a small ministry here. Building in a small city. What can we do, Lord? Can we do anything? Can we have any effect? Definitely. You can have a good effect or a bad effect. But despise not the day of all small things. Don't you know that sometimes God gets pleasure in, in Him building? In Him building? When you see, well, it's not man. It's not Brother Mauser. Let's get this. It's not man that did it. It's God that's built this. Yes. It's God that's built this. So Lord help us, uh, Brother Delbert, to see through the eyes of God. And Brother Donald, to be faithful to our vision. We're to be faithful to our vision. Your vision of Christ should not cause you to hate anybody. Your vision of Christ should not cause you to persecute anybody. Your vision of Christ should not cause you to crucify anybody but yourself. Now the vision of Christ will cause you to crucify yourself. But it's not our place to crucify any brothers or sisters. We're not to crucify anyone. Except so if you if you feel like crucifying somebody, go at it. <coughs> but make sure it's just you. Make sure it's just you. <coughs> and make sure what you're crucifying is the old man. And the more room that you make for Jesus, the more you have. And the more you crucify of him, of the old man, the closer you're going to get to God. And uh, crucifying him is just serving God to do his will. That does not include taking a whip and beating your back. 
That does not include crawling up stone steps till your blood, your knees bleed. That does not include hunting down uh, unbelievers and killing. That does not include being a, a mob that will destroy others. But it, it's very good. Yeah. Having a spirit of love, and joy, and peace, long suffering, gentleness. Well, the Bible said, God is a gentle man. He is very gentle. He's very gentle. If you'll let him. And he can be rough, but he's a gentleman. And that's how it will be. All right. Look forward to tomorrow. Let's go before the Lord and before we